My name is Jim. I'm a musician in Nashville, and I'm trying to figure out where guitar tone comes from. I've done deep dives on the electric guitar, sustain, string, scale length, and now it's time for speaker cabs. The speaker cab is the wooden box where the sound comes out, and I'm interested in seeing how that wooden box affects the guitar tone. This started last summer when I went to a friend's house. That's a lot of different sounds. Then over Christmas, I brought my amps and cabs up north to Michigan and started testing them out. In these three cabs, the speaker model was the same. The loop of playing was the same. What could be causing the differences in sound between them? I went on the internet and read everything I could. And the deeper I dug, I kept finding endless amounts of tiny details that people said affected the warmth, punchiness, airiness, tightness, looseness, and whatever they think the word resonance means. If every single one of these things contributes to the tone of a guitar cab, then cab building must be an extremely detailed process that requires a true craftsman's precision to get everything right. Otherwise, the cab might kill the warmth, punchiness, airiness, tightness, looseness, and resonance. So I did the work and took my unskilled hands and shot for the absolute floor of guitar cab tone. Clamp it this way. Don't kill yourself on that. Yeah, I'll try not to. This is the scrap cab. It was made entirely out of old, warped and rusted leftovers for zero dollars by someone who had never built a cab before. I expected rattles, buzzes, no low end, no high end, an absolute sonic mess, but I loaded it up with two vintage 30s and played a loop through it and my orange cab. Huh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. Maybe I'm crazy, but I don't think the sonic distance between these two cabs is big enough for a hundred different factors to all make their own audible difference. So back in Nashville, I wanted to go further, and I thought it'd be really cool to have some kind of way to run the same all-encompassing test through a bunch of different cabs that showed exactly what the differences were. So I did the work, and I learned how to use a piece of software called Room EQ Wizard. Now I could send a sweep of every frequency humans can hear through my cabs, and the program would show me what that cab does to any signal that gets put into it. Here, I'll show you. In general, the more different these lines are, the more different the tone sounds. I marked a spot on the floor and carefully placed the mic the same distance from the speaker each time and ran about a hundred tests on guitar cabs trying to answer every question I've ever had. You with me? Let's go. First I tested my car combo, then took the back panels off and it wasn't that big of a change, took the chassis out and it wasn't that big of a change, then took the speaker out and that is significant change number one, a speaker sounds different by itself than it does in a cab. I didn't want to tear apart my car any further, so I decided to build a cab that I could mess with for testing, and I knew from earlier that I wasn't very quick or accurate cutting circles with a jigsaw, so I wondered, do 11-inch hole saws exist? With the new cab, I thought it'd be cool to test sections one at a time, so I tried speaker versus baffle, then baffle versus frame, then frame versus closed back. And that gave me significant changes number two and three. Bare speaker versus baffle sounded different, and no back versus closed back sounded different.
When I put the back on, the cab had a rattle on the low notes, so I put a couple more screws in the baffle, that wasn't it, added feet, that wasn't it, and put a couple more screws in the back, and that was the issue. So call that significant change number four. If the back isn't snug and there's too much space between screws, it might rattle. Seeing and hearing the difference between no back and closed back made me wonder, at what point does a closed back cab become an open back cab? So I did the work and drilled bigger and bigger holes in the back until I was out of drill bits, then carved holes until I got tired, then sawed squares until there was no more room. I never would have predicted the results I got. A cab does not simply go from closed to open. The first 14 holes I drilled behaved identically to a closed back. I honestly thought trapped air mattered and the cab sound would pop like a balloon as soon as I drilled the first hole, but the cab didn't seem to care if it was airtight. It kept sounding the same. After that, the low end cratered, but then the weirdness started. At seven and a half inches, the low end started coming back, and then it came back more and more until the back was completely off and the low end had a steady slope again. But what does this actually mean? It means the low end isn't just fullest with a closed back and thinnest with no back. There's actually a point in between where it gets thinner than either of them, depending on the note and how big the hole is. See if you can hear what I'm talking about. But cabs usually don't have holes and squares cut in the back, they have gaps between a top panel and a bottom panel. So I made another back and cut it to make smaller and smaller panels with a bigger and bigger gap, and it showed the same kind of thing but much more quickly, maybe because more wood was getting removed each time. So this would certainly be significant change number five. The size of the back panels and the gap between them has a complex relationship with what goes on below 200 hertz. So that could affect how full the low notes on the wound string sound. After that, I wanted to test baffles. Dr. Z sometimes uses double baffles, and 50s Fender Tweed Amps apparently had thin baffles, so I added a second piece of wood with a hole in it, tested it, then took both off, did some sanding to one of them, put that one on, and tested again. Now that I had this thinner, more flexible piece of wood, I wanted to test floating versus fixed baffles. The idea is that fewer screws lets the baffle flex more, and that causes some kind of different sound. I'm not sure what. So I tested from two to eight screws, both open and closed back, and the lines were almost identical no matter how many screws were in. Maybe floating versus fixed baffle isn't a thing. What if the hole is off-center? I made some more baffles and tested with the hole offset to the side, downward, and upward. What about slanted versus straight cabs? I tested my 112 straight and flush with the edge of the frame, then slanted backward, and then straight but recessed back a couple inches. Up until now, this 112 had been birch plywood. What if I changed the material? I started by swapping the birch ply baffle for cheaper oriented strand board, then did the frame and back. At this point, I thought it would be cool if I could do some baffle tests on a 212, and if ply and OSB don't sound any different, then I could stretch my video budget a little bit farther. So I did the work, got more OSB, and made a 212 with two different baffles. One put the speakers as close together as they could be, and the other put the speakers as far apart as they could be. Sixties Fender Bassman and Bandmaster cabs had dividers between the speakers, so I made a divider and put it between the speakers, and this gave me significant change number six. A sixties Fender style internal divider adds a little bit of low end, listen for it on the low G note. I wanted to test grill cloth, but I didn't have grill cloth, so I pulled out six white t-shirts and draped them over the speaker one at a time and every single one of them messed with the sound across the whole spectrum, with an extra big drop off around 700 and up. So significant change number seven, t-shirts over the speaker affect the tone. But t-shirts aren't grill cloth, so I broke down and got some used grill cloth that happened to come with a Marshall 412, two birds, one stone.
It took all four pieces of cloth to do less than half of what one t-shirt did, but this is technically significant change number eight. Multiple pieces of grill cloth can add up to audibly reduce high frequencies. Speaking of things in front of the speakers, did you know there were wooden planks crossing in front of the speakers on vintage 60s box combos and cabs? I didn't until recently. It seems like a big thing to leave out of all the reissues and clones. So I made my own planks and put them in front of the speaker on my 112 and guess what? Significant change number 9. The Vox style planks knock down everything above 3K, sometimes up to 10 dB. Remember how I had that Marshall 412 now? Well, I wanted to see if the sound changes when you have different off-mic speakers. So I started with the cheap speakers that came with it, then kept swapping them out with vintage 30s, bringing me to significant change number 10, the off-mic speakers matter, at least in this case. What about that post in the back of Marshall cabs? I read that it makes the front and back resonate in phase. Well. Okay, let's see. I also got another cab. This is a custom 212 from 2007 that belonged to JT Cornfloss, and it has a switch that lets you pick whether the speakers are wired in parallel for four ohms or series for 16 ohms. What kind of difference does this make? And I have another one of JT's cabs. This one is from around 1996, and it has the option of plugging into each speaker separately for running stereo. It has two of the same speakers, so this is a good chance to test how much of a difference one versus two speakers makes when everything else about the cab stays the same. Interesting. Significant change number 11. Number of speakers matters, but the difference here was much smaller than I was expecting. I thought of this idea. What if you had two cabs that were the same dimensions, same volume and cubic feet, but the speakers were mounted on different sides? Would it matter if one had the speaker in a baffle that was bigger and could theoretically flex more, or if the other cab was deeper instead of wider? So I did the work and I made the six hole cab. This cab is 15 inches by 25 inches by 35 inches, and there are holes drilled in every side so the speaker can go in anywhere. So what does it sound like? Can you hear the sound of different size baffles or different depths or widths or heights if the total volume's the same? By now, I've tested almost everything I can think of about a guitar cab, except for the elephant in the room, cab size. Cab size is a tough one because I can't just take my Marshall cab and make it smaller, or my car combo and make it bigger. And even if I borrowed cabs from everyone I know, there would still be too many differences in how they're built to pinpoint what effect size had. So I did the work. These are the nine size cabs. The difference between them is their size. There are three 112s, three 212s, and three 412s. They run from very small to very big, but their dimensions are no accident. I went to Sweetwater.com and made a spreadsheet of the dimensions of every 112, 212, and 412 cab they sell. And I built a cab for each format that has the minimum dimensions, the average dimensions, and the maximum dimensions. So the smallest size has the narrowest width of any cab, the shortest height of any cab, and the shallowest depth of any cab. The largest size has the widest width of any cab, the tallest height of any cab, and the deepest depth of any cab. Then the middle size has the average width of all widths, the average height of all heights, and the average depth of all depths. This goes for 112s, 212s, and 412s. All of them were tested with no back and with a closed back. It was at this point that the video went way over budget, so these cabs are going to be sponsored by my PayPal email address. If you send money to this email address through PayPal, I will receive it. No need to drag other companies into this one. I remain independent and unbiased. First, let's look at the absolute extremes. Here's the minimum size open back 112 versus the maximum size close back 412. Now the smallest and biggest of each format, both open and closed.
how about the difference between average size 112s, 212s, and 412s? So, significant change number 12, cab size matters. That's 12 things that seem to significantly affect the tone of a guitar cab. Quick recap. 1. A speaker by itself sounds different than when it's in a cab. 2. A speaker by itself sounds different even when it's only in a baffle. 3. A cab with no back sounds different than a cab with a closed back. 4. A closed back cab with a loose fitting back panel and too much space between screws might rattle. 5. The size of the gap in the back of a cab has a complex relationship with low notes under 200 Hz. 6. An internal divider affects the low notes under 200 Hz. 7. T-shirts over the speaker affect the tone. 8. Multiple overlapping pieces of grill cloth over the speaker affects the high end. 9. Vintage Vox style wooden planks in front of the speaker affects the high end. 10. The off mic speaker can affect the tone. 11. The number of speakers affects the tone. And 12. The size of the cab affects the tone. All of the other things, like impedance, floating versus fixed baffle, slanted versus straight, plywood versus OSB, they didn't really move the needle. And these results might seem confusing. They weren't exactly what I was expecting. I'm just a musician, I don't know anything about physics, but after listening to all the tests, looking through all the data, and doing a little bit of wavelength math, I think I might have one possible explanation. What if we don't hear the cabs? What if we don't hear them vibrate, don't hear them resonate? What if we only hear the speaker, and the cabs cause the speaker to move differently by making some frequencies easier and some frequencies harder? The lows and mids from the front of the speaker will wrap around the cab and either cancel or add together with the back of the speaker, and that path will be different if it's open versus closed or a different shape and size. The lows and mids from the back of the speaker will bounce off the inside walls and either cancel or add together with themselves, and that will be different if it's open versus closed back or different shapes and sizes. If the material, like wood, generally doesn't let sound through and reflects it back, it might just be the geometry that makes the cab affect guitar tone the way it does. If this is the case, then any two cabs that have similar enough geometry and have materials that transmit and reflect sound similarly enough should be able to be extremely different in other ways and still sound pretty close to each other. So I asked myself, what's the dumbest material I can make a guitar cab out of? This is styrofoam. It is lightweight, brittle, artificial, and I imagine it resonates and vibrates differently than wood. I sliced it up and caulked together a cab that's the same dimensions as my orange PPC-212, which is a $900 guitar cab made out of 13-ply Baltic birch. So, using the same mic'd up speaker, I tested both. Which do you think was which? I'm going to keep doing videos like this for different parts of the chain. Hopefully you'll join me.